Good morning and welcome to Plymouth Congregational Church here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Come on in. I'm Hal Corpenning, the senior minister here at Plymouth, and I'm glad that you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning in worship with us. Come along here. Here at Plymouth, we like to say no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here at Plymouth. You may be in Europe, you may be in Asia, you may be someplace else in the US, but no matter where you are, we're really glad that you're here as part of our worshiping community this morning. If you're looking for a bulletin, you can find one online on our website at PlymouthUCC.org slash bulletin. I hope that your experience this morning is spirit filled and I hope that you're able to connect with the spirit of the holy as we worship God together. Welcome to Plymouth.
Good morning. Oh, that was a little subdued. Good morning. <laughs> and welcome to Plymouth Congregational Church. We're an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. And I'm glad that you're here with us, either here uh, in the pews or joining us from home. And a special welcome to any of you who are our guests this morning. We're really glad that you're here with us. Um, by the way, the ministers love to say hi if you're visiting. So we'll be greeting out in the fellowship hall immediately after the service. So we'd love you to come by and say howdy. Um, <clears throat> Thank you to all of you for accommodating our pivot once again to um, being mask donned. And uh, hopefully this little phase in the, our life of COVID will pass quickly. But here we are, and we've made the, made the shift beautifully. So today we have sort of a milestone in our service. Blair Carpenter, who has been with us for four years, um, today is her last day at Plymouth. And um, I don't know if you all know what it was like for us doing worship during lockdown, but it, it was, A, it was no fun <clears throat> because you weren't here. Um, but B, Mark and Jane Ann and Blair and I worked together a lot. So Blair would drive up from Denver every Wednesday and every Sunday to be with us. And you are going to be dearly, dearly missed. Um, Today is also a day when we recognize our lovely choir for persevering through pandemic. Um, you know, it's like that old song, Faith of Our Fathers, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. You've been here, so thank you all for doing this, and we look forward to seeing you back in the fall and out here in the congregation in the meantime. Um, <clears throat> some personal news. Um, my cancer treatment is going well. Um, I still have about five months to go in terms of the medical, um, you know, taking medicine part of prostate cancer treatment, but it's going well. The numbers are good. The other news is I get to have a brand new right knee. <laughs> and so I'm having um, knee replacement surgery on June the 9th, um, which is the feast day of St. Columba of Iona, who I consider to be my patron saint. Um, so that's, I'm feeling great about that, and I'm um, looking forward to not being in pain all the time. But I'll be away for, um, for two weeks and then working my way back in gradually. So you'll um, see a little bit less of me in June. Um, JT, our colleague, is off to France tomorrow morning, bright and early, with his spouse. They're spending a couple of weeks there uh, studying St. Mary Magdalene and um, her tradition there. And he'll be back on Pentecost Sunday, which is June the 5th. So here's something really cool. For the first time ever, as, at least as far as I know, we are doing a Volunteer Appreciation Sunday for all of you who volunteer uh, with Plymouth. In years past, we've done Teacher Appreciation Sunday, but we decided to widen it and to include everybody. So that's going to happen on Pentecost Sunday. And by golly, I hope that we're able to have um, cupcakes or something <laughs> for you to eat by then. Uh, worst case scenario, we'll have them outside. So uh, please do join us in a couple of weeks. That's June 5th. So I invite you to take a couple of deep breaths and just feel yourself at rest and presence in this place or at home. Open yourself to the presence of God in our midst as we prepare to worship God together. Will all who are able please stand and join me to the call, in the call to worship. God, we give you thanks for the sisters on whose sh shoulders we stand. For deacons, priests, and pastors. For 
for faithful women in every time, including our own. God, we give you thanks. Amen. Will you now join me in the unison prayer? Open our eyes and our hearts to acknowledge the women who have shaped our faith in every age and the women who have touched our own faith journeys. Help all your children be open to the amazing ministry women offer our church in all its expressions. Do I have some children who would like to come and join me? Oh, good. Here come Lily and Charlotte. Oh, awesome. And Annabelle and Clara and Vera. Perfect. All these strong young women. Woohoo. Hi, friends. Good to see you. I'm so glad you're here today. Today we're talking about. Women, girls in the church. Probably doesn't surprise you that there are girls in the church. Yeah, because all of us are girls. Because all of you are girls, that's right. That's so fun to have you here. So I wanted to share with you, first of all, and then I'm going to tell you about my mirror there. You like those flowers? I'm going to tell you about those, yeah. So in the very first book of the Bible, which is called, anybody know what it's called? Genesis is the first book in the Bible. And the word Genesis means beginnings. And in the very first chapter of the very first book in the Bible, we hear the story of creation. And this is what the story says at one point. So God created humankind, people, in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God created human beings in the image of God. 
Now, what does that mean, an image? Mm -hmm. Do you know what an image is, Vera? Yeah. A picture, yes, an image can be like a picture, absolutely. So a likeness, right? Something that looks like, that seems like, that maybe in essence is like. So when we look in a mirror, what do we see? You. You. You see yourself, don't you? You see, I see me here. Yes. There's Lily. There's Charlotte. There's Annabelle. There's Clara. There's Vera. We see ourselves. And this is an image. It's a picture of ourselves, isn't it, when we look in the mirror? Yeah, yeah. It's like a hand mirror. Yeah, this is a hand mirror. You're right. This hand mirror is special because it was used by my grandmother and probably my great-grandmother and maybe their sisters. And it was given, then my mother got it. And she's the one that painted the flowers on there, my mom. You can see her name right there. It says Betty. She, play, play, she painted those flowers. So this is a special mirror for me. And when I look at it, I see myself. And it reminds me that I am made in the image, in the picture, in the likeness, in the out of the very stuff of God. So when I say, what does God look like? I could say, God looks like Charlotte, and like Lily, and like Annabelle, and like Clara, and like Vera. But a lot of times we hear God looks like father, but God looks like mother too, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you guys have some very... <laughs> so you guys, what does your mom do? Uh, take care. She takes care of you? Yes. Does she bake good stuff? Yeah. Yeah? Definitely, yeah. yeah. definitely. What does your mom do? <laughs> she makes cookies. <laughs> she helps you with crafts. She helps you create things. So when you go to school or to daycare, what does your mom go to do? Work. 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 Your mom is a lawyer, and she's a public defender. And your mom goes to work at CSU, and she does important things keeping, I don't know all the important things she does, but she keeps animals safe. I know that. She works. And your mom goes to CSU, and she's a professor, right? A teacher. And she also works with animals some. Moms do all kinds of things. And your dad, right. But today we're talking about how moms look like God. Yeah. And how each one of you, as a girl, looks like God. Yeah. So in a few minutes, there's going to be some pictures up here. Hal's going to show pictures during his sermon on that screen. Uh, I and, think I've had a screen. Yeah, we have a screen. They're going to show pictures of some, some women, and those were women that used to teach us about God and that looked like God. So will you pray with me? Yeah. Let's hold hands. Can you make a circle? This is a circle of powerful women. Yeah. Yeah. Holy One, thank you for this circle of powerful women and all the love they represent in the world, and all the powerful women that are out in our congregation that teach them, that work with them, that bake with them, that create with them, that go to work and do important things in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you all. You may go back and sit in your seats, but watch out for the pictures of the women, okay? In just a few minutes, they're coming. <laughs> Good morning. For this next hymn, it'll be new to you, no doubt. 
So the choir and I will sing and play uh, verse one in the refrain first, and then come join us for one, two, and three following. So I guess you got the theme today, right? It's, uh, we're talking about women in the early church. And um, it's, yeah, choir, if you want to go ahead and, and go, um, and so you can see the slides too, that would be fine. Um, it's also one of those days when um, we should be offering prayers of technology because I'm driving the whole thing from my iPhone. So <laughs> it worked last time. I'm hoping it's going to work this time too. So the text that uh, I'm going to read you in just a moment comes from the Acts of the Apostles, 
which is really a whole lot about Paul. And today uh, we have an episode that is going to feature a woman prominently. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the regions of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit kept them from speaking the word in the province of Asia. When they approached the province of, of Mysia, they tried to enter the province of Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, Troy, instead. A vision of a man from Macedonia came to Paul during the night. He stood up urging Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. Immediately after he saw this vision, we, Paul and his followers, prepared to leave for the province of Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We sailed from Troas straight for Samothrace and then came to Neapolis the following day. From there, we went to Philippi, a city of Macedonia's first district and a Roman colony. We stayed in that city for several days. And on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the riverbank where we thought there might be a place for prayer, meaning that there might be a synagogue there or also that it may be that the followers of, of Yahweh may be meeting there informally to pray. We sat down and began to talk with the women who had gathered. One of those women was Lydia, a Gentile God worshiper from the, <clears throat> from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. As she listened, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message. Once she and her household were baptized, she urged, now that you have decided that I am a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And so she persuaded us. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. I don't think it... We can underestimate how important it is that we acknowledge the very critical role women have played in the Christ movement since its very beginnings. You know, we often think of Paul as being misogynistic, and some of the readings attributed to him certainly are, even though they're not likely to have been written by Paul himself. To be sure, he was a Jewish Christian male in the first century, and that is a very different historical and social location than our own. But we've heard in this scene from Acts of the Apostles what happens when he is sent by Jesus, by Christ, to Philippi in Macedonia, which is now part of Greece. He goes down to the river on the Sabbath and he begins to talk with women which in itself is a little bit unusual. The women who were gathered there. And here he meets Lydia, a Gentile woman who worships Yahweh. We learn a couple of important things about Lydia. She is the mistress of her own household. That's important. We don't know whether she didn't have a husband or whether she was just the head of the household. And we learn that she and her household, the people whom she influenced most directly, were baptized by Paul. We hear that she is a dealer in purple cloth, a luxury item. So purple dye in those days came from the murex snail, and it was difficult to produce, and it was costly. And so it became associated, purple cloth became associated with royalty. It's why during Lent, we use purple as the liturgical color. Once Lydia and her household heard the good news from Paul and had been baptized, she invites them in to stay with her. A another sign, not just of radical hospitality, but perhaps also of patronage. This is really important in the ancient world. We have clients and we have patrons. After Paul and Silas are imprisoned and then escape, they come back to Lydia's house again. The Church Universal has an enormous apology to make to women. 
not just today, but women across the millennia for denying them a place at the table, denying their spiritual gifts, barring them from ordination and office, and for diminishing or dismissing their vision, their faith, their hard work, their ministry, and even their very lives. If we truly believed with Paul that in Christ there is no east or west, male or female, we sure have a funny way of showing it. Even in our own congregational tradition, we bear the shame of banishing Anne Hutchinson from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1630s for teaching and interpreting scripture. Heavens. You know, as an ordained man, I, I, I don't think saying, I'm sorry for my own and for my forebear's ignorance. I don't think that's quite enough, although I say it. So I'm gonna tell you some stories of Christian women in the early church to at least make sure their names are spoken and their stories are heard and understood. The painting that you've been looking at is an early funerary painting of a Christian woman. If she looks Mediterranean to you, that's because she is. And all Christians were in the early centuries of our faith. There were very few Norwegians in the ancient Near East. <laughs> the main female figure of early Christianity, of course. Oh, are you gonna stop now? We can do it. Oh, sorry. Okay, avert your eyes for just a second. Okay, you can look now. Bink. Yay. The main female figure in early Christianity is, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Orthodox Church honors her as the Theotokos, the God-bearer. And she's the subject of amazing imagery throughout the ages. But our forebears, the reformers, did something horrible. They basically eliminated devotion to Mary, and we Protestants have become poorer for it. She's a central image of the divine feminine in our tradition. You know, I was so touched by what Jane Ann was saying to those five girls because that is such an important message for girls to hear. And it's not one that I ever heard in the church growing up. So in this painting of the Annunciation, she's in dialogue, Mary's in dialogue with the Archangel Michael, and she consents to bearing the Christ child. And in this fresco from the church of San Frediano, and even though Frediano sounds really Italian, he was an, an Irish monk. I don't think they called him Frediano in Dublin. Um, but this, this is a, 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 an early fresco in Lucca uh, in Italy. And she's in conversation with her older cousin, Elizabeth, who is carrying John the baptizer. I love this image by Botticelli called Mary of the Magnificat. Remember during Advent, we always read the Magnificat from Luke's Gospel. And you'll notice that she is writing um, Luke's Gospel in Latin, no less, uh, Magnificat anima mea dominum, my soul magnifies the Lord. But she's not the only Mary in Jesus's life. Mary of Magdala is described in some Christian tradition as the apostle to the apostles. She doesn't flee like the male disciples at the foot of the cross, but she stays there with Jesus and then goes to the empty tomb where Jesus tells her not to touch him since he has not yet ascended to God. This is in um, the Museum of San Marco in, in Florence. Then it's by Fra Angelico. 
Pope Gregory I, in his infinite wisdom in 591, conflated the story of Mary with the unnamed faithful disciple who anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair that we just sang about in that hymn. And in doing so, he perpetuated unfounded gossip that she was a repentant prostitute. Does it ever say anything in scripture about her being a prostitute? No, it does not. Legend say, says that she left Gaul, modern France, and left for Gaul and lived there. And JT and his wife are flying there tomorrow to learn more about Mary of Magdala. So I'm imagining that we are gonna hear some good stories when JT gets back. Women are well represented in the first centuries of Christianity in the art of Christianity in the Mediterranean, including this uh, mosaic, which is now in a museum in Cortona, Italy. Look at the position of her hands. This is a posture of prayer in the early church. And sometimes you'll see me and Jane Ann and JT when we're blessing the communion table, you'll see us in this position. It's called the orons or the praying position. And when a woman is in this position, it signifies that she is a woman of deep faith. It's not the only time you're gonna see that position. This is a woman on a third century marble sarcophagus, now in the Vatican Museum, again portraying a woman's living faith. This is a fourth century mosaic, also in the Vatican Museum, showing a woman again in that position of faith. And this is a little bit difficult to see, but it's <clears throat> a very early Christian glass medallion of a woman with an inscription which you probably can't read around the top, Dulcis Spiritus, a sweet spirit. One of the most interesting churches, <clears throat> pardon me, in Rome is called Santa Preseda, and it was founded in the fourth century, in the 300s. This image above the chancel is a mosaic and it shows Jesus in the center and on your left, St. Paul with his arm around Santa Preseda and then further over to the left is Pope Pascal. You'll notice that Pascal has something that looks like a spacesuit helmet um, and it is not a spacesuit helmet. It's actually a square nimbus, a square halo. And what that indicates is that he is still living so here we have St. Peter in Santa Prudenziana along with a priest holding a Bible. Notice where his arm is. This is Peter, keeper of the keys to the kingdom of God. And in this close-up, we see Santa Preseda and Paul. You can tell that it's Paul because he has a very distinguished hairline, just like mine. <laughs> Does this, does this look like Paul the misogynist to you? Does, he, does it seem to illustrate the subordination and the repression of women to you? Just wait, it gets even better. In a dark side chapel in the church of Santa Preseda, the, the church of San Zeno, there are four women in this mosaic and I'm gonna focus on the woman on your left. And I'm sorry that the image is kind of fuzzy because it is a dark chapel. And I flick the lights on with a, you know, a one euro coin and then, well, there it is. So the woman on your left <clears throat> is Episcopa Theodora. You can see, I, I kind of wrote in the letters that you really can't read on that mosaic. Episcopos is a Greek masculine noun for an overseer. So epi means over and skopos means seeing. It's the Greek word for bishop, and which is why the Anglican communion in this country is called the Episcopal Church, because it's run by bishops. But wait a minute, how could there be a woman episcopa, a feminine noun? A, a, a woman bishop? Now, some historians have suggested that she herself wasn't a bishop, but that her husband was. 
Okay, does anyone else share their liturgical title with the spouse in the church? I mean, we don't call pastors, spouses, present company accepted, um, reverend unless they're ordained too. And wait, did, did someone say wife of a bishop? Huh. Anybody know any Roman Catholic bishops who are married? Any, anyone? Anyone? Um, actually, married priesthood has been a part of the church longer than celibate priesthood. Priests were allowed to marry until the Second Vatican Council in 1139 AD. And women bishops? You may have heard John Philip Newell on in our chancel 10 days ago, telling of the legend of St. Bridget of Kildare, who was consecrated by a bishop named Mel in Ireland. And an early text has him putting down objections by saying, no power have I in this matter. The dignity has been given to God, by God to Bridget, beyond every woman. Hmm. So these are pieces of an altar in the great church of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which of course was uh, built by the Emperor Constantine as a church. And then later, after Constantinople became Istanbul, it became uh, a mosque and today it's a museum. But if you look at that panel on the right, you'll see a woman at the table presiding with an altar boy who's holding the missal, who's holding the words of the liturgy. And again, of course, she's in the Oron's position. This object is made from ivory, and it's probably third or fourth century. Um, it's a pyx, P-Y-X, which is a vessel for storing consecrated communion hosts that can be saved for later or brought off-site to a communicant. It's kind of strange, isn't it, that it's decorated with women in the Oran's posture? Could it have been that women consecrated the bread? These three women are standing at an altar with a man in this mosaic. Again, could it be that women were priests and deacons in the early church? Not surprisingly, some men found this very threatening to their sense of power and authority. And they did their best to ensure that women were driven from church leadership. This image is from a cave in Ephesus, like the letter to the Ephesians in modern day Turkey. Paul is on your left, and you can just barely see his name in, in this slide, but it's Paulos. And on his right is a woman named Thecla. Thecla is one of the great heroines of the early church. Both she and Paul have two fingers raised, and this is the posture of teaching and proclamation. She was a powerful figure. So someone took it upon themselves to gouge out her eyes and to chip away and then to burn her fingers in the teaching position. This isn't the end of the story. The Empress Theodora was the patroness of the magnificent church of San Apollinaris in Ravenna, Italy, which was then the capital of the Western Roman Empire. You may know about the incredible mosaics there, including this one showing her as the patroness. Remember, patron and client? And her retinue endowing the church with communion vessels. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to turn on your time machine and fast forward 1,300 years to upstate New York. Antoinette Brown, later Antoinette Brown Blackwell, was the first woman ordained in the modern church in 1852 by her congregational church in upstate New York. She had graduated from Oberlin College in Ohio 
the first coeducational college in the country founded by Congregationalists. But the faculty got a little bit touchy when she wanted to do a graduate degree in theology. But since at Oberlin, the founding policy of the institution was coeducational, she was admitted and she, was grad and she graduated. This was a monumental step for women's ordination in the modern world. But it took until the 20th century for many mainline denominations to embrace the ordination of women. You know, I, I listed some of the, the churches here, and Jane Ann wanted me to remind you that in the Southern Baptist Convention, local churches were ordaining women in the 1960s until the men put an end to that. You know, we have so far to go not just within the parts of the Christian household that refuse to ordain women, but in the UCC and here at Plymouth. We have amazing women in this congregation, women who have served as moderators, as deacons, as clergy, We need to give thanks and honor the gifts of these women leaders, both lay and ordained. And we must support them in sharing their gifts with us as they help to guide us as a congregation into the future of this beloved community. May it be so, amen. Changing of the guard. <laughs> God has given each of us so many gifts and graces to live out. And today we celebrate those given to women down through the ages. And we give thanks for those gifts and graces. So let us do that, not only with our time and our talent, but also with our resources for the good of God's family and beloved community. One of your inserts will have a, the choir anthem text for when our music God is glorified. And you'll see an overt invitation to join us on verse 4. Please do.
Please stand now. <laughs> Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. For the gifts of faithful women in our midst, we give you thanks. With gratitude, we give back all we can to further your realm, here and now, and still unfolding. Accept our gifts, our faith, and our lives in your service. Amen. Now you may be seated. And we come together to share our prayers um, and concerns and lift up those things to God. Um, I have a few to, to share with you. Um, to begin with, and making sure we don't have any more emails. Um, we want to pray for uh, the parents of uh, Tom Hubertsey, Melanie Hubertsey's in-laws. Um, they are in Iowa, uh, both with um, already health concerns, and they've just uh, they've just come down with COVID. So we want to pray for them. Uh, we want to pray for our own Bill Thompson, who has uh, Ann and Bill returned from a trip out west to Utah. And Bill came down with COVID. Uh, so that's why they're not here in the choir with us this morning. So we pray. Huh? Oh, Dean Wallace. Okay, we just found out Dean Wallace has COVID. So um, thankfully, we are in a phase when most people are not going to the hospital for this. They can recover at home. Many of you have recovered. But we want to keep these people in our prayers. God of compassion. Um, I also want to keep um, Lois Daubert in our prayer. She is in the hospital. Um, I do not know why, uh, but we'll, she was hoping to prepare for surgery in June, so we pray for swift healing for Lois, God of compassion. And then um, one of our members, Joan Langer, um, is... Uh, with her mom in Iowa, Iowa City. Uh, her name is Jean Libby, and um, her mom had a stroke after a, a surgery that did not go well and is now uh, in the final days of her life. And so we pray for, uh, for Jean in her peaceful transition. We pray for the Libby family and the uh, Langer family. Um, Joan's father, Scott Libby, um, was head of world missions for the UCC, which later became global missions and was trans, um, uh, when we decided that we needed a partner denomination, partner with each of the global, the countries around the world in which we serve uh, and send missionaries. And so, um, He's kind of historic UCC figure. Um, and let's keep the Libby family in our prayers. God of compassion. And so other prayers this morning. I'll start at the back here. And you may lift up your prayers. I'll ask you to stand, identify yourself, uh, give us your name, and, and then lift up your prayer. Any prayers here in the back? Lynn. Matheson? Matheson. Matheson. Dan Matheson, a beloved Poudre High School teacher, uh, died recently, and Lynn is remembering him and all the impact he had on students and on the world. God of compassion. Yeah. Other prayers this morning here. Timothy. taken into captivity into Russia. Most of them are soldiers, women, and men who will not probably survive. So I'm praying that they do survive and they do come back to their families. Thank you.
Timothy is um, a PhD student here and is often with us in worship uh, from uh, the Ukraine. And so he is praying for, I'm gonna get this right, people who, in, who have survived the, um, the Azovstein? Azovstein. Was that the, um, yeah, in Mariupol. And they have been taken as um, prisoners into Russia, and uh, their prospects seem dire, but we pray that they will survive and will make their way back home. Um, we have been keeping Ukraine in our prayers, and Timothy is um, just, you're, you're such an icon of the, this suffering for us um, because he has family in Lviv. And um, so we pray, continue to pray with you. And you can continue to support uh, Ukraine if you go to our Plymouth website. There's still, a, um, on the Give page, there's a way you can still support uh, our UCC work with the Church of Hungary in Ukraine. So for the people of Mariupol who have been taken into Russia, we pray for safety, for healing, and uh, for God's presence, God of compassion. Cyrus. I'd like to lift up a prayer for all of the, the high school teachers who went through finals these past couple days and that they tried their best and did all they could to make the experience as enjoyable as possible. <laughs> and I thank them for that. It's not easy to teach hundreds of students finals. And so. Thank you. Thank you, Cyrus. Cyrus lifts up all the high school teachers who have gone through, through uh, finals. Uh, he being a high school student that has gone through finals, um, but recognizing that it's not easy for the teachers either, and they are left with grading papers, and as well as shepherding the students through the finals. God of compassion. Yeah. Any more prayers out here? And I will move to the choir. Do we have prayers from the choir? from Blair. Right. Um, and for my last Sunday, at the risk of perverting Ms. Lamont's theology, <laughs> I would like to offer two prayers at the same time, which are thanks and wow. We can say the same for you, Blair. Blair Carpenter lifts up two prayers uh, today. Um, in, in the prayer system of Anne Lamont, who, who says we, need, we can say help, thanks, and wow. And she lifts up the two prayers of thanks and wow. And we lift those up um, in um, gratitude for your time among us. Mark, would you also um, say a little bit about Blair's time among us? Yeah, well, absolutely. A prayer of thanksgiving, of celebration of Blair's four-year tenure here, plus as our staff singer. Um, it has been a joy, has been a lot of fun. Uh, she brought with her so much diversity of music. If you've been to the nine o'clock service or even here, we can do such a wide range, of, you know, art music, the choral singing, uh, Beatles, David Bowie, whatever. You know, you have someone <laughs> who can do all that, understand it. But she brings with her, of course, the conservatory music school training with a master's degree in vocal performance from Georgia State. And she also went to Cleveland State as well, if you didn't know that. Um, and you can hear the results of that. And plus her leadership in the choir within the section of the soprano section, a very important section, uh, providing that pillar of quality singing, which we've been enjoying every week for the last four years. So thank you, Blair, for being with us and best. Yes. As Hal said in, early in the service, Blair has been driving from Denver to be with us uh, and during the pandemic did that on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. Well, I don't know, sometimes you were here three times a week, but <laughs> in our recording schedule and um, we are so grateful and we wish you God bless and Godspeed 
And um, may you bless another faith community there, <laughs> should you so wish, in the Denver area. God of compassion. If there are no more prayers, then I will invite us into a time uh, of lifting up these prayers and others from our hearts, and we will sing our way into a time of silent prayer. Holy One, God of the women who through the ages have answered your call, your call to service, your call to love, your call to birthing in the world. Each of us is only here because a woman birthed us literally, and because women have been part of caring for us, whether our biological mothers or others in our lives. May we see your image in the women around us, in the young girls growing with their joy and their enthusiasm and their creativity, in the students pursuing passionately what they love in the young mothers and the mothers of teens and the mothers of young adults and those older, in the grandmothers. May we remember all these women and may we be inspired, inspired by those who are putting their lives on their line in Ukraine to bring medicine, to bring food and aid, and to help people leave where they are living if it is dangerous and move to safer places. May we be inspired by those who represent us as lawyers, as teachers, as scientists, by those who cook good food and who bake and who nurse us when we are sick. Holy One, may we remember that we are all mothers of the divine, for you are always needing to be birthed in this world, no matter the circumstances. Bless us. Hear our prayers and be with us as we remember the prayer of Jesus saying it together. Our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
ground of all being, mother of life, mother of the universe, your name is sacred, may we know your breath. God promised that God's peace would always be with us. May we pass that peace one to another. The peace of Christ be with you all.
Before I offer the benediction, I'd like to ask you to do something. Think of a woman who has changed your life and informed your faith. It could be your mom, a sister, an aunt, a grandmother. It could be a theologian. It could be a minister, a Sunday school teacher. Think of that woman. Think of that woman and offer God thanks for her witness and her formation of who you are this day. And go out today with the blessing of God, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, one God and Mother of us all. Amen.